Today we're going to have a good look at the cross-country mountain bike. We're going to be checking out why they're so light and fast and what it is that makes them so different from other types of mountain bike. As you might gather from the name, Cross Country or XC bikes are designed to be ridden up, down, along and over anything at speed. To accomplish this, they must be extremely light and very efficient when it comes to pedaling. And like downhill bikes, the name both suggests what they're good for and also the race category in which you can compete. Now a few points about the Cross Country bike. Primarily, it's all about the saddle riding position. They need to get power down very efficiently. The next thing is they must be incredibly light in order to do so lap after lap. There also needs to be room for multiple water bottles on the frame due to the nature of the racing. And the final point, if it's a full suspension bike like this one, then that design is critical. It can't waste any unnecessary energy through the pedaling. Unlike the downhill bike, which is a zero compromise design, cross country bikes have to meet a compromise. To be this light and this efficient at pedaling and covering ground, they're never gonna be quite as good when you point them down through rocky, rough or technical terrain. To get through that sort of stuff on a bike like this requires a lot of rider skill. However, what they lack in terms of all out control, they more than make up for in all out speed. And that's really why I love the cross country bike because of the fact they definitely keep you on your toes. They make you work hard. Okay, so let's start by looking at the frame design first. Now, typically a cross country bike, the primary function of it, it needs to be extremely light. Now, some cross country frames are so light, in fact, they have rider weight limits with them. And bikes themselves, full suspension bikes can be anything from around 10 kilos up to 11 and a half kilos but some hardtail bikes not featuring rear suspension on them can be as little as nine kilos and some frames as little as 790 grams. Now 790 grams for a frame, like that's a full size frame, that would be light if it was a road bike, let alone an off-road bike. Now you can get frames made from various different materials. You can get titanium, you can get steel even, you can get aluminium and of course carbon. But really in terms of the ultimate race bike, carbon at the moment tends to be the king. Geometry on cross country bikes is nowhere near as aggressive as most other forms of mountain bike like trail bikes or enduro bikes. It's focused entirely around efficiency and agility. Now whilst cross country frames all may look a bit different, they do share a lot of similarities. To keep the weight down, it really is as much about simplifying the frame design as possible. Now virtually all of the carbon frames out there will have things like press fit bottom brackets, which deals away with having to have that alloy insert bonded into the frame. Many of them will deal without having a conventional headset and will have drop-in bearings on there. And many of them will share a fairly similar suspension design to this one. Now this bike has a single pivot design. You can see the main pivot here just above the chainring and it has a linkage that drives the shock. Now this linkage will be different on all bikes and it's designed to basically manipulate the shock however the designer sees fit. Down at the back of the bike here, where on trail bikes you'll have a linkage here or perhaps down here, this bike relies on the flex of those two tubes moving together to give it that supple feel on the back. And of course, by lacking that additional suspension hardware, it means they remove more weight from the bike. The less moving parts, the better. Now, many cross-country suspension bikes offer a remote lockout system for the rear shock. As you can see here, there's a little cable that operates the lockout switch on this shock remotely from a little control on the handlebars. This means essentially when you're out pedaling, you can have the shock open, so it's doing its job when you're rolling through the rough terrain. And as soon as you want to get that power down, click of a button and it becomes a hardtail. It's a super efficient design. And one final thing that applies to both hardtail designs and suspension designs is that most cross country bikes follow a fairly traditional frame layout. But if you ignore the fact this has a shock, you still have a front triangle and a rear triangle doesn't look too different. The same goes for the hardtails. There will be some exceptions, but most cross country bikes follow a fairly traditional silhouette. Now, of course, with modern day trail and enduro bikes, we're really familiar with the longer, lower, slacker type effect. You know, the, the short stem, the long frames, all that stuff. 
It will add to a bit more weight though. These are designed to be light. Hence the longer stem and a smaller frame. The smaller the frame is, the less material that's on the frame, the lower weight it has. The bikes are designed to be agile and responsive, in particular in race situations. This is why the geometry on these is a bit steeper. It has to be responsive because you're racing in close proximity to others at various different speeds on various types of terrain. You need to be able to act instinctively anytime. Cockpit position and saddle position combined together are designed to make the transition from seated to stood as minimal effort on the body as possible. Now, when it comes to angles on the bikes, there's no sort of set in stone geometry for cross country bikes, but they do share a lot of similar numbers. Chain stays tend to be 430 to 435. Wheel size will always be 29, but we'll dive into wheels a bit later. Head angle, 68 to 70 degrees. Seat angle, 73, 74 degrees perhaps. A bit shallower than you might hear with trail bikes, which tends to be topping out up to about 78 degrees these days. Cross country bikes will always have suspension of some kind. On a full suspension bike like this, you can expect them to have 100 millimeters front and rear. Occasionally, you might see an 80 millimeter travel bike, but the standard tends to be about 100 mil. Rear suspension designs actually tend to be fairly similar for good reason. Super lightweight and very effective. This one's a single pivot with a linkage that drives the shock. You might see a four bar design here and there, which have an additional pivot on the chainstay. But typically, this is a fairly standard style system on there. You'll always see an air shock absorber though. You'll never see the heavier coil shocks as you see on more gravity biased bikes. And as far as hardtails go, you can have anything from 80 to 100 mil travel on the front forks. As far as gearing goes on modern bikes, it tends to be up to 12 speed on the rear. Uh, 11 speed you do still see on some racers bikes by preference. Tends to be a single chain ring mostly up front these days, although some of the big marathon events like the Cape Epic, you do see riders having a twin chain ring on the front, which means you can't run the 12 on the rear, you need to run 11 with that style configuration. Uh, sometimes you just need those extra gears when you do those massive multi-day endurance style cross-country races. Cranks will typically always be carbon. They'll be 170 to 175 millimeters in length, whereas on gravity focused bikes, they can be as short as 160 millimeters. And of course, these are all about being able to get the power output uh, down to the trail. So the longer length does that better. Sometimes you'll see a power meter there and you'll always see clipless pedals on cross country bikes. Brakes will almost always be hydraulic lightweight options uh, compared to what you see on the trail and enduro and downhill bikes. Levers will pretty much always have carbon lever blades. Calipers will be two piston versus their bigger four piston brothers. You just don't need that much power on a super lightweight bike. And the disc rotor sizes will always be smaller. This bike has a 160 on the front and a 140 on the rear. Now you might be wondering why you wouldn't have more powerful brakes or like four pistons or bigger rotors on a bike like this. Well, frankly, the wheels and the bike is so lightweight. If you had more powerful brakes, you'd be locking those wheels constantly. So it's all in relation to what the bike is about. When it comes to wheels, 29 inch is almost completely accepted as the standard in cross country now, certainly on the racing format. We did see 27 and a half here and there or 650B, but 29 inch is king. So a few things about the 29 inch wheels that you see on cross country bikes. They're big, they're fast, and they've got good rollover speed. They've got great momentum, which is something you need when you're constantly churning power in. You don't want to have to be topping up. You want to be keeping that speed across the surface. However, one slight problem you do have with 29 inch wheels is they accelerate slower because they're bigger. They also decelerate slower. So to get around that, cross country racers need extremely lightweight wheels. The downside of extremely lightweight wheels is it can be very difficult to get them stiff enough or strong enough to cope with the riding. Now it is possible to get very lightweight alloy wheels, but the majority of cross country racers will be choosing carbon wheels because for the same weight, you can get a slightly stiffer and slightly stronger wheel. It's not always the case, but for the large part, you'll see racers donning cross country wheels made from carbon. Now rim width varies anything from 24 up to 30 millimeters. Racers like Nino Scherter favor the wider tires and the wider rim profile that is needed in order to support those. Now there's one more thing I want to say about the 29 inch wheels on a cross country bike that makes them so pivotal in how they handle. 
Take yourself back to smaller wheels previously, 26 inch wheels, your bottom bracket height would effectively have been much higher. Now look at where my bottom bracket is, it's effectively lower than where the wheel axles are, even though it's the same equivalent height off the ground no matter what wheel size you choose. Because of the fact the bottom bracket is effectively underneath your wheel axles, you retain an amount of stability from a bike that you couldn't get with 650B wheels or with 26 inch wheels. 29 inch wheels has 100% improved the handling and stability on cross country bikes. And tyres, you guessed it, it's all about being light and rolling fast. Some racers will go super, super lightweight, other racers will choose something with a bit more meat to it. But what you're looking at with a set of tyres, typically you'll have multiple compounds in them. These tyres have four compounds, for example. And what that means is you can have a softer compound on the shoulders, so you've got a bit of traction on the corners, and a firmer compound on the centre tread, so you just roll that bit faster. It's all about covering ground as fast as possible. The lighter those tyres are, the quicker you're going to be going. Now, in more recent times, we've seen cross-country racers committing to running their setups tubeless, and even more recent times, the last few years, we've seen tyre inserts being favoured. By running a tyre insert, you get a few really good benefits. Firstly, it enables all riders to run a lighter tyre because you've got the additional support from that. But also, in a race situation, the lightweight inserts you get, they're often made from foam, I mean, if you do get a puncture, you can continue to ride the bike round to your technical support area and get the wheel changed for a fresh one. It means essentially you're losing less time when you get a puncture. Brilliant tech. Okay, so saddle and seat post setup on cross country bikes. Now the saddle of course is down to personal preference, but all cross country saddles will tend to have tie rails on them and they'll be extremely lightweight. Again, it's all down to the rider's preference. Seat post though, this one's a bit of a divider. Some bikes like this hardtail have a carbon fiber seat post that's a non dropper, it's just a fixed seat post. Other bikes like my Canyon Lux here has a dropper post on it. I like a dropper post because I can get my body weight nice and low, but not everyone does. Now this might sound mad to you if you like using a dropper post, but think about this. The whole point of a cross country bike is to be extremely light and efficient. And by putting a dropper post on it, some racers have been known to say that they need bigger brakes because they're riding faster suddenly and then they need heavier tyres to cope with those faster speeds. So accordingly, you're adding weight back onto the bike. So it kind of negates the point of having a drop post in the first place. So interesting theory there. Nino Scherzer famously hasn't ridden a drop post for exactly that re reason in recent years. But uh, hey, look at the way he rides. He certainly doesn't need one by all accounts. But it's a personal preference thing and drop posts will be becoming more popular. There is one other factor you might not consider with a dropper post though, that cross country riders wouldn't like. In a cross country race, if you're using a dropper post on all those sections you need one for, you're essentially doing squats every lap, every time you need to put that seat post down. That might not sound much to you as a trail rider or whatever type of rider you are, but in a cross country race where you are giving it 100% output, you're simply wasting energy doing that. And for that reason, some cross country racers choose not to use the dropper post, which sounds crazy to me. There is a brand though called BMC that make really nice bikes and have a very cool integrated seat post design. On some of their racers bikes, it has a self dropping feature. It has a cartridge on the frame that you actually pump up. And when you push the button down that would normally release your seat post, it has a two way feature, one to drop it and one to extend it again. Brilliant technology that may see daylight on other cross country bikes in the future. I certainly hope so. And up to the cockpit of the bike here, we're looking at handlebars and stem. Stem lengths tend to be anything from 60 to 90 millimeters. This one is an 80 here. And handlebar length tends to be from 700 up to 760. These ones are a little bit wider because I'm a tall rider and I like a wider bar. There's no rules or regulations. It's down to your preference as a rider. But the smaller your bars are, the more narrow they are, the lighter they're gonna be. When it comes to your handlebar grips, there's no preference as such, although we do see those weight weenies out there running the foam handlebar grips, which are extremely light, uh, but they wear out extremely fast. So uh, that's down to personal preference. And many cross country riders choose to use some kind of electronic device like a Garmin to monitor training, like their heart rates, uh, what their power meter is doing, cadence sensor perhaps on the cranks, all that sort of data, very commonplace to see. There we go. 
That's everything about cross-country bikes. Light, efficient, and if you ask me, some of the best looking bikes you can get. Uh, if you've got any questions, let us know in the comments underneath, and we'll see you in the next video. See you later.